We're reading tonight from the book of Romans, please, chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Um, we will we'll begin to read from verse 7 of this chapter. So Romans 7, verse 7. And uh, you, I think you know well enough that Romans 7 is uh, Paul really talking about the struggles that he encounters. And he, the struggles that he encounters as a Christian man. Some people have tried to make Romans 7 a, a sort of uh, Paul sidestepping, as it were, for a moment or two, uh, leaving his train of thought and the development of his uh, sort of theology. And so he breaks off between the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 8, and he, t he talks about something completely separate. But this is a man talking about not his, his struggles before he became a Christian. This is a man talking about his struggles as a Christian. And uh, so this is also relevant to our thinking about uh, the, the subject of meditation. So let's hear the Word of God together then. Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Amen. And, and God will bless the reading of his word. Uh, we'll reference the Puritans tonight um, uh, quite a bit, but not to try and elevate them or put them on a par with uh, the word of God or anything, but just to get some help from them this evening and as they are people who have written a lot about meditation and they have valuable insights. One of them, uh, Edward Calamy wrote, a true meditation is when a man doth so meditate of Christ as to get his heart inflamed with the love of Christ. So meditate of the truths of God as to be transformed 
into them and so meditate of sin as to get his heart to hate sin. And certainly the, the last of those three things that he says there is very evident in what the Apostle Paul writes here in Romans 7. Uh, we have mentioned uh, the last time that we were together thinking about some of the things that we are to meditate upon. One of them chiefly was the works of God. And another that uh, we understand very uh, obviously we are to meditate upon is the Word of God. And that's what we find the Apostle Paul doing in Romans chapter 7. He's talking about his, his own interaction with the Scriptures, and in particular, the law, the, the moral law uh, without question. And so he identifies the impact that that has upon him as he considers it. So we, we see that what he's doing in this occasion is more than just a, a casual reading through, a restating of the commandments. There's a consideration of what the commandment says. There is a thought in his own mind about the connection between the law and himself. And he begins to see himself relative to the law of God. And that has a very decided impact upon him. And this takes us back to what we had in, in Psalm 1. Remember, a few weeks ago we, we read that psalm. Uh, at the blessed man. What does he do? He meditates in God's law day and night. And he's, he's pictured as a tree planted by the rivers of water. Uh, he bears his fruit in the season. His leaf doesn't fade. And whatsoever he does uh, shall prosper. And that sounds all very positive. And it is. Uh, and we should catch a sight of that. But part of the positivity of the blessed man is what is not found in his life is the the absence of certain things and the absences are the sinful practices now how do you get rid of sinful practices well part of that is to see the sinfulness of sin to see the wretchedness of sin to learn to as edward calmy wrote to meditate of sin as to get his heart to hate sin so we have to think about sin but not think about it in the way that the devil would have us to think about sin, which is to look at it and to desire it, to, to see it masquerading as a good thing, to see sin painted up with a nice shiny veneer that makes it look attractive, but rather to see sin as God reveals sin. So, for example, think of how Solomon in Proverbs uh, cautions us and, and, and brings us to look properly upon sin. So he says, you, you see the painted picture. You, you see the image. You see the thing that is alluring and is tempting. But he says, understand what's really at work there. Look behind the exterior. Look behind the pretty picture and you see that there's actually, there's poison in the chalice that there's deceit there, there's destruction, that to go through that door is to descend the steps that lead to hell. So that's painting the, the accurate picture, and that's a, a proper meditation on sin, so that we would, we would hate it, we would be averse to it, we would recoil from it. And so Paul, uh, here we, we know the particular sin uh, that he is uh, speaking of, and perhaps this is one that predominates in his life. The commandment says, thou shalt not covet. And this strikes him through. Paul was afflicted by covetousness. Some commentators would suggest that when Paul talks about the sin that so easily besets us, or besetting sin, or even when he talks about his own particular struggles that a sort of thorn in the flesh that he has, that might well have been a spiritual struggle, not necessarily a physical problem. That Paul has in mind covetousness. That's, that's Paul's particular struggle. Which, if you think about it, he's a Pharisee. It's not really difficult then to, to see that that is the case because the Pharisees suffered from covetousness. But he begins to see the sinfulness and, and he begins to hate this sin that he... he 
not just knows is a sin. So this isn't just an academic knowledge of sin or that in some way uh, it's a problem for him in, a, in an sort of unemotional, detached way. We, we read a man here who feels his own sinfulness and the wretchedness of that, oh wretched man that I am. And this, this comes to pass in his experience because he's meditating on the Word of God and he, he sees the, the hatefulness of sin. But to move sideways slightly, as it were, and think about the, some of the ways that the Puritans helped uh, or help us to make use of the Scriptures, because to meditate in the Scriptures uh, is very general in a sense. To, to say meditate in God's Word, well, of course, that's what we are to do, and we are to use all of the Scriptures. But sometimes it helps to categorize areas of Scripture or to, to think about broader areas within Scripture as areas of Scripture upon which we are to meditate, to uh, deduce from Scripture areas of doctrine uh, or, or general sort of theological outlines. Now, the Puritans could sort of go, if you like, somewhat overboard on this. We'll come to that in a second. But they, they do offer sort of general guidelines, and they're very practical, if nothing else. Sometimes they, they do seem to be scary, and they, they get into a lot of detail, and they go down a lot of rabbit holes, and when you've got your three main headings, and then there's 17 points under heading one with 13 sub-points under the fifth point of those 17, it all gets a bit uh, dizzying at times. But they are sometimes worth pursuing, and you can get other people that will uh, help you with the Puritans and, and sort of derive the uh, the essence or the kernel of what they are about. Um, and, and in a practical way, the Puritans would suggest that reading the Scriptures and meditating upon it is to select a, a verse or some doctrine and just begin to consider it. Just begin to meditate upon that particular truth. Begin with an attribute of God, they would have suggested. Just consider one subject at a time. The temptation is to jump from one thing to another. But the, the purpose here is to, to be still, to settle our minds in one particular subject and just dwell on it, and to try and squeeze out of one particular, fairly narrow, def, narrowly defined subject area, to squeeze as much out of that as is possible. And they also suggest that, and this is very useful for us, I think, as well, that we don't do this with a, a sort of a blindfold approach or some sort of uh, chaotic approach. In other words, we should meditate on things that are particularly relevant to us at any given time. And, and so they would suggest to us that the things that are most needful at any, any beginning, any moment in time, so they would say, for example, if you're spiritually dejected, meditate upon Christ's willingness to receive poor sinners and pardon all who come to him. If your conscience troubles you, meditate on God's promises to give grace to the penitent. If you're financially afflicted, meditate on God's wonderful providences to those in need. In other words, you've got a problem. There's something that's happening in your life now. Well, that doesn't mean that what we're to do is to say, well, I'll go and meditate on something completely, as it were, unrelated. Well, here's the problem that I'm facing at the moment. I'll meditate on that particular issue. I'll find relevant scripture. It doesn't have to be a relevant 57 verses, a relevant text, and meditate on it. Let it speak to you in the situation that you are in at that moment and time. Allow it to address your needs. Sometimes we are perhaps too, we, we romanticize the Christian experience. That is, we say, well, here I am with all of the, the things that are going on in my life, and I'm going to come to my sort of Bible reading, I'm going to come to my time before the Lord, and I, I'm, not, I'm not going to go to a 
it's a portion of scripture that addresses the particular needs that I have. I'm just going to open my Bible randomly and see what God says, or I'm just going to follow my reading plan and see what God says. Now, sometimes God does speak in that way. We know that. But there's nothing wrong, and there's everything right. When we are experiencing some particular crisis or issue, that we go to the scriptures and we find a relevant portion of scripture and we meditate upon it. Um, sometimes you used to, I guess it's still the case, I think the, the, the Gideon Bibles I remember, and you'd open up at the front of the back and it would say verses for you to, to read or to think about when, and then it'd be a whole list of different sort of feelings, experience and so on, and, and a relevant scripture. Not a bad practice, very useful. So think about the struggle that you're having, the issues that you're facing, and, and go to the relevant place or places in the Word of God and dwell on what God says to you in your situation. Now, as I said before, the, the Puritans can get a bit uh, in-depth, shall we say, and that's where they can sort of scare us off. One uh, Puritan, Bishop Joseph Hall, uh, when he was setting out various categories and subjects upon which to meditate, well, I don't know how many you would uh, think about tonight. He managed to get 87 subject areas for meditation. Now, that gets a bit lengthy, and the time you get to point 34, you've maybe forgotten point two, and you, you know what I'm saying. That's a bit maybe uh, unwieldy, isn't it? 87 subject areas for meditation. Uh, we don't have to have 87. You can, you can make a list. You can think yourself and think about different areas that you can meditate upon and, and use those as a, as a structure. It's helpful as well for this reason. When you're reading the, the scriptures for yourself, you can identify within those readings certain subject areas. So here, as I come to my scripture reading, we ask ourselves simple questions like, well, what does this passage or what is this verse or this section tell me about the person of God? What does it tell me about his nature or his character or his being? What does it say about his, his power and so forth? What does this passage tell me about sin, but the nature of sin, types of sin and so forth? What does it tell me about myself as a sinful fallen creature? What does it tell me about the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ? What does it tell me about my relationships with other people and in the church and the home and society and so forth. And, and we've got subject areas that we have a sort of framework in our minds. When we come to read the scriptures, we say, well, those are things to think about uh, uh, that are rel re relevant to, to me and my experience as, as a Christian. But let's just look at some others again that are uh, maybe not so many. Uh, just as sort of suggestions uh, that we can have for ourselves. Uh, again, the Puritans would suggest that one of these is the majesty of God. The majesty of God. And George Swinnick said, above all, meditate on the infinite majesty, <coughs> purity, and mercy of that God against whom thou hast sinned. Stephen Charnock said it. Uh, be often in the views of the excellencies of God. And on and on they go. There's many other quotations along the same line. That we are to meditate on, on the greatness of God. And as we thought last time, creation reminds us of that. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows forth his handiwork. The creation that God has made, this general revelation is preaching to us the very being of God, his power and his Godhead, the majesty of God. And to, to know that God is, and that this is really the, the foundational point, isn't it? To know that God is, because everything else in a sense stems from that. We can't really know anything about ourselves until we know who God is. We don't know how small and in a sense, insignificant we are until we know how great God is. And as we start to contemplate the greatness of God, 
we look at creation and we see its vastness and maybe you're, I don't know if you've seen those pictures of uh, the latest uh, vehicle that they've sent to the planet Mars. Uh, I just find it somewhat fascinating that you, know, you can send something there and it has all these uh, all this equipment and you can send pictures back and you can get pictures from Mars. Uh, why anybody would only go there when you see the pictures is beyond me. Um, you know, contrary to my childlike thinking, it's, it's not actually a big giant Mars bar in the sky. Um, that, that was sort of my childhood thought, that would be a good place to go, but it's pretty inhospitable. But you look at that and you, you begin to, to, to see that those things that you've heard about, names, dots in a, in a page, it's, it's something that's got substance. There's a, there's a massive rock planet out there, not unlike our own in terms of its the fact it's composed of something solid. And, and God made it as part of this solar system. And this solar system is only one such solar system in our galaxy, of which our galaxy is only one of many others in the universe. And then you stop and you think, but God, God is outside all of that, stretching in every direction beyond the capabilities of our mind to comprehend just how far he keeps going in every direction because he's infinite. And we stop to think about the greatness of God and we begin to realize that we, with all of our finite, temporal um, uh, limitations, are, are so very, very small and little. And, and from that flows all kinds of thoughts. The fact that God would think upon us, the fact that God would show us any uh, interest at all uh, in a personal level and that, and that God would love me. And so it's important that we, we consider the, just to meditate on the, on the fact that God is. How many times in the day do we sort of forget that God is? And it leads us in all kinds of wayward directions with fears and it, we, we can career off into sin and we can become overcome with fear and, and so forth because we just forget to think, well, God exists. God is. And here's one of the, the, the central truths of that, that belt that Paul talks about that really holds us together, that strengthens us. God is. And it's vital that we meditate then on the majesty of God. The second sort of subject area, general subject area that the, the Puritans would emphasize is the severity of sin. Again, uh, to quote the two that we've already quoted, Swinnock and Charnock. Swinnock said, Man never comes to a right knowledge of himself. What a pitiful, abominable wretch he is till he comes to a right knowledge of God. What an excellent, incomparable majesty he is. And Charnock says, In the consideration of God's holiness, we are minded of our own impurity. So his immensity should make us, according to our own nature, appear little in our own eyes. And again, this really stems from what we've already seen and what we've seen with Paul in Romans 7. We, we see ourselves for what we are, which again leads us into the third point, which is it leads us to consider the beauty of Christ. Now, how do we see the loveliness of Christ? Unless we see Christ through the eyes of a sinner, there's there's no beauty in Christ that we would desire Him. If we see ourselves as being, on the whole, not so bad, or capable of making ourselves pleasing in God's sight. So you think of the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't think that they had any particular problem. So Christ to them was not somebody that they felt they needed. And so you've got that contrast, and we made reference to it, uh, not so long ago, in, in the house of Simon the Pharisee. You've got Simon the Pharisee, he won't give Christ the hospitable uh, uh, greeting that is, that is uh, customarily extended to someone coming into your home. There is no water to wash his feet and so on and so forth. And Simon's a man who looks with a, a degree of disdain upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The lady, this prostitute that's come into the home, who's sitting at the feast, She's conscious of her sin, and she's at the feet of the Savior, washing his feet with her tears because she recognizes that she is a sinner. There's no doubt in her mind about her own unworthiness, and she, she feels after Christ. She has a love for Christ because her sins are known to her. And because she realizes that she needs Christ, 
She loves him. There's a beauty in Christ. She desires Christ because she knows that she's a sinner. And she's got a proper, she's got a, a view of her sin that is God-given. The, the, the devil-given view of our sin is the one that says, oh, you're a sinner. Jesus won't want anything to do with you. But the, the view of sin, as, as God reveals it in his word, is you're a sinner and there's a savior for you. And no, no matter how awful that sin is, no matter how often our sin is shown to us, what does it do? It leads us with the Apostle Paul to behold the beauty of Christ. So we, we, we hit rock bottom, we hit that point where we cry out, I'm a wretch. I loathe myself. I, I, I hate, in a sense, what I am because I, I, I love what's right. I, I love the, the truth of God. I love the law of God. I, I have a desire after that from an internal perspective with my mind. I can see that God's way is right. I can see that his law is right. And, and there's, there's that within me that desires it. But, but I'm living in this body that, that yearns, that craves after sin. So I'm, I'm this bundle of contradiction. I'm wanting to do what's pleasing in God's sight, but I'm, I'm busily doing the thing that I know I shouldn't do. Who will deliver me from this? Who can set me free from this? Who can deliver me from this tyranny of sin that I feel in my flesh? And he says, I thank God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And there's a sense of, of relief there. And it leads him on to say, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And, and so it leads him to see the beauty of Christ, uh, someone once pointed out that when we think about uh, the, the Passover, the Jews were to eat it with bitter herbs. And the bitter herbs were apparently to remind them, so the rabbis interpret it certainly later on, to remind them of their afflictions and in Egypt and the salt water that the parsley's dipped into reminds them of the tears that they shed during their afflictions. But the point is this, the bitter herbs are complement to the meat. And so there's a sort of a culinary thought in there. The, the old sort of uh, sweet and sour, we think that's a Chinese thing, but it's not. It could be argued uh, that it's Jewish. People say spring cleaning's Jewish, and that's you know, sort of the Passover thing, and you spring clean the house, and that's where spring cleaning came from. Well, sweet and sour, it's maybe more Jewish than it is Chinese. The bitter herbs do what? They complement the lamb. They make the lamb taste sweeter. And when we sense and when we know the bitterness of our own sin, in God's design, that is that we might appreciate the greater sweetness that there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's true, isn't it? When, when we're not particularly troubled about our sin, we, we come to Christ in a kind of academic, perfunctory manner. We're being good Orthodox Protestants, and we, we know that we need Christ to be our Savior, and, and we're thankful that there is a Savior, and we acknowledge Him. But when we feel our sin, when we really feel filthy, and when we loathe ourselves, and we get a sense of just how utterly unworthy we are, and we come to Christ, and we, we receive from him forgiveness, and we know that we are accepted in Christ before God, and we cast ourselves upon him, and we feel the blood applied afresh, as it were, and we know that there's cleansing in the blood, and, and we have peace through the blood of the cross. How precious Christ is in those moments. There's a sweetness in him that... that is thrilling to our soul. So we're to meditate on the, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another subject, the fourth sort of general area, is the certainty of death. The certainty of death. Swinnick said, think often of thy dying day. Robert Bolton said, all the pleasures, treasures, and comforts of this life must all upon the stroke of death be suddenly, utterly, and forever left. One of the things about the, the whole coronavirus issue over the last year is that 
you know, deaths is, is, is there, isn't it, in terms of people mentioning it, talking about it, talking about the number of deaths and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, the thing that the secular media and society doesn't talk about then is what happens after death. Uh, it's, it's just so there's a finality, um, but it, it misses the point because death, of course, is leading us to eternity. Death leads us to the presence of God. It leads us to judgment. And it is good that we think about our death and we're conscious as a society that we haven't really done that in the way that we perhaps should up until now. We're so busy trying to live. And in a sense, that's what we see society trying to do. We're trying to escape thinking about death, um, not saying that we shouldn't do anything to address problems, but, but, but part of what lies behind the addressing of the problem is let's try and avoid death. Let's try and avoid thinking about it. And we, we see that demonstrated in so many ways in our society, don't we? Uh, you go to a funeral and nobody talks about death. I, I find that the most bizarre thing. Somebody has died. It, it, you know, it's good to go to the house of mourning. But we, nobody goes to the house of mourning anymore. Pe we go to the celebration of life. We're in the presence of death and people are talking about life. And, and that's strange. There's something eerie about that. I find that uncomfortable. Because one of the most important things that we can do when death comes is to stop and think about the day that we're going to die. It's good to do that, but we've turned it on its head. Let's not think about the subject of death. And so the, the Puritans encourage us to meditate on the day when we die, because that day will come. And it's not a morbid thing, but it's to, it's to contemplate that too. What does it do for us to contemplate the day that we will die Obviously, it sobers our thinking. It, it makes us think more about how we're living now because we're, we're conscious one day I'm going to die. This could be the day that I'm going to die. It doesn't mean that we stop doing everything, does it? It's like Luther said that if he knew he was going to die tomorrow, he would still plant an apple tree today. In other words, you get on with your business, but you do your business to the glory of God. You do it right. It's not about living differently so much as it is about living rightly, righteously, doing the right things, conducting your everyday business today, if you're going to die tomorrow, but doing it in a God-honoring way. It also crystallizes our, our thinking so that we uh, are, are not in terror, I, I suppose, that we understand the day of our death in light of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. That we're seeing salvation not just as some sort of vague kind of idea that's out there that we believe that we're going to be saved, but we're preparing for that day that we see that there's nothing to fear in the day of our death because we are secure in Christ, that Christ goes with us into death and he keeps us in death. So we're already, we're already meeting that day, we're already prepared for it. So when the day of death comes, if we have a consciousness of it at all, we've already thought about it and there's a settledness in the anticipation of it. It's good to think ahead. It's good to think about the day of our death because it will come. Uh, and so it's, it's important that we meditate uh, on these things. Fifthly, the fifth subject area is the finality of judgment. William Gurnall said, Surely thou wilt not easily sleep while this trumpet that shall call all mankind to judgments shall sound in thy ear. The reason why men sleep so soundly in security is because they either do not believe this or at least do not think of it seriously so as to expect it. And with this lethargy in mind, Bolton instructs individuals to ponder what it will be like to give an exact account of all things done in the flesh. Now that's sobering. That's a sobering thought. And that, to some extent, is going to make us uncomfortable and shudder. That we have to give a strict account on that day. We have to give an account of today and yesterday. We'll have to give an account of tomorrow. But one of the reasons why we are lax and careless is because we don't meditate on the fact that I'm going to have to give an account of this day. And therefore, I'm going to be careful how I live today so that I will give an account of it. And I can, I can do so with a degree of... Uh, 
uh, quietness in my conscience that, that I have lived this day for God. So we, we meditate on the day of judgment. Sixthly, the miseries of hell. Swinnock described hell as a privative misery because sinners lose earthly delights, carnal contentments, spiritual preferment, and so on. Uh, Bolton again speaks of the privation of God's glorious presence and eternal separation from those everlasting joys, felicities, and bliss above. Swinnock described hell as a positive misery because of what sinners gain, explaining the wicked shall in the other world depart from Christ into fire. They shall not only be stripped of all good, but also be filled with all evil. At that time they will gain, he says, a perfection of sin and a fullness of sorrow. It might seem strange for us to hear that kind of talk and, and we're almost again an evangelical if we call ourselves a, or identify as being part of the evangelical world, we don't think of hell in those terms. We don't think of hell as being sort of the perfection of, of God's righteous judgment. We don't see it in, in, in that way. Uh, it's something almost not to think about or the, at, at the most to mention to scare sinners into thinking about God and per perhaps believing in God. But there's a, a sense of meditating on, on that, that we see something of, the again, the, the holiness of God and the, the judgment and the justice of God, and that God will be glorified even in that, as well as, obviously, it's something that we would avoid and have others to avoid. But the seventh subject area, this is the last one, uh, that they suggest is the glory of heaven the glory of heaven. And Richard Baxter said, I would not have you cast off your other meditations, he says, but surely as heaven has the preeminence in perfection, it should have it also in our meditation. That which will make us most happy when we possess it will make us most joyful when we meditate upon it. And how true that is. Remember what we said on the Lord's Day, or thought about together on the Lord's Day, that the Savior saying to his disciples as they come back with glorious reports of how successful their evangelistic efforts have been, he says, look, in essence, you can rejoice in those things. It's understandable that you rejoice to see the power of God at work in people's lives, but he says, don't rejoice in those things. Rejoice rather that your name is written in heaven. So that the chief joy, and in a sense the psalmist understands that when he talks about Jerusalem, we look at that psalmist talking about Jerusalem as being our chief joy, and we understand that to be our heavenly Jerusalem, our place with the Lord. That that's to be our chief joy above all other joys and delights. It's heaven. And we're to meditate upon heaven. And the hymn reminds us that the glorified spirits in heaven, they, they may have more joy, they may have a sense of uh, more uh, peace and, and so forth, but they're not more secure. We're just as secure as they are. But we can begin to share in something of their joy. We can begin, begin to share in something of their joy when we meditate on the place where they are. And I, I think that whenever a Christian dies, one of the, the glorious things that brings comfort uh, to those that are bereaved is to consider where that person is now, to consider what they are part of now, that glorious multitude of the redeemed and the perfected above as they sing the praise of the Lamb. You begin to picture in your mind's eye as the scripture gives us indication of what that is like, to hear what they're singing and to see the scene that they are seeing as it is, it's given to us in some, uh, to some degree in, in, in sort of vague detail, if you like, by the, the scriptures and revelation in particular. We can begin to sing along with them. We can begin to share in that joy of what it is to be set free have no more struggle with sin, to 
have no more understanding of this, O oh, wretched man that I am. We contemplate, we meditate upon the glories of being in heaven. And if we would have ourselves to know joy tonight, then meditate upon the triumph and the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ as it is experienced by the saints that are above. So these are just seven general sort of areas of thought or meditation. You can certainly add to them. Some have suggested that you and, and others have, have taken this and they've looked through various Puritan writings on meditation and seen that they uh, will flag some of these things up, a, a sort of a, a, a system, a systematization of theology. There's different areas of theology that systematic theology classically has set out as the different departments of theology. You can take that kind of categorical list and, and say, well, those are areas for me to contemplate. And if you, those are readily available if you want to find them out. But you, you can use these different things just as areas to, to form your thoughts around and to say, well, there's something for me to meditate upon today, to take the time. So you come to your scripture reading, personal or, or, or family, and there's something in there that, that, that is suggestive or it's, it's what you've read, meditate upon it. It might, be, it might be something else. It might not be something that you've read, particularly in the scriptures. It, it might be some doctrine. It might be one of these subject areas that you just say, well, for five minutes, for 10 minutes, whatever it is I'm going to I'm just going to meditate on that, on that doctrine, what I know of it. You read something in a, in a book that contains a, a brief explanation of the doctrine, a paragraph or, or two, and you meditate on who God is and what God has done, how God reveals himself to us, what sin is, what death is, what the reality of eternity is. And you meditate on these things, and it will be of tremendous benefit to our souls. And next time, God willing, we'll, we'll think a little bit more about sort of the practical details of, of, of what we do with these meditations and, and how it, it benefits us. So may the Lord bless these things to our hearts tonight. And again, may we be encouraged to be more deliberate and decided even in our meditation upon God, his work, and his word. Amen and amen. Well, we'll take